Welcome to The Jenna Ellis Show, sponsored by Legacy Precious Metals. There has never been a better time to invest in precious metals. Visit LegacyPMInvestments.com. That's LegacyPMInvestments.com. On Jenna Ellis tonight, Seth Gruber gives us the gruesome history of Planned Parenthood founder Margaret Sanger. Yikes. Josh Hammer dissects Kansas's effort to sue Pfizer for the claim that the vax is safe and effective. C.J. Pearson tells us why more Black Americans are supporting Republicans than ever before. Chris Murray details the 24 Republican attorney generals trying to stop Jack Smith from silencing Donald Trump. And we talk debate prep with Tho Bishop. What does Donald Trump need to do to defeat Biden? I say he shows up in an orange jumpsuit just to troll him. Be sure to tune in to Jenna Ellis tonight. Hi, friends. Jenna Ellis, host of Jenna Ellis Tonight. And we are experiencing instability at every level. Our government lacks leadership and Bidenomics has been an utter disaster. The economy is in a fragile state. Inflation has been a constant issue. High interest rates have put significant pressure on the real estate market. There have been major bank failures and many analysts say a stock market correction is likely overdue. We have global conflicts in Europe and the Middle East, and those have the potential to spread, but gold has soared to record highs even among the tensions. So there are so many reasons that Americans should consider wise investing and investments in gold and silver, and legacy precious metals is the gold standard. I love Legacy Precious Metals because of their zero hassle education first approach. They can help you roll your traditional IRA into a gold IRA or ship metals directly to your house. Go to LegacyPMInvestments.com, download the free investor guide, and I have read it. There is so much valuable information there. Friends, now is the time to not roll the dice on your hard earned money, find out about the growth potential that is in gold and that gold offers you. Contact Legacy Precious Metals and make sure to tell them that I sent you. Welcome to Jenna Ellis tonight. My name is Jeff Hunt. I'm filling in for my good friend, Jenna Ellis. I'm a radio host with the Salem Media Network in Denver, Colorado. Well, let's jump into the news and commentary that matter most to you right here, right now. Have you heard of the name Margaret Sanger before? If you haven't, you should. She's the founder of Planned Parenthood, and there's a new documentary that exposes the real agenda of the radical abortion movement. Check out this trailer. We're going to expose and discover who the real Margaret Sanger was and how her attack and assault against the family in America explains our current culture of death and upside down world that we're living in today. This is where it all started. It was here that Sanger opened up her first unlicensed, illegal birth control clinic in 1916. Study the past, not just to understand what happened then, but to understand what's happening now. This is a Leviathan. Doc Cow, it's a fitting place to remember what happens when bad ideas are taken to their logical conclusion. We bless the holy name of Jesus and we shout, let the baby live. Let the baby live. Let the baby live. Baby live. Stop waiting for someone else to grow a righteous culture of life for you and on your family's behalf. It will not happen. If, if not you, who? If not now, when? Seth Gruber is the CEO and founder of the White Rose Resistance 
and he's the director of this new film, The 1916 Project. Welcome to Jenna Ellis tonight, Seth. Jeff, brother, good to see you again. So let's talk about what you hope to achieve by exposing who Margaret Sanger, the founder of Planned Parenthood, is. <clears throat> yeah, brother, we're a ministry birthed by and for the church. Uh, we just turned two years old, um, uh, about. I launched right after the overturning of Roe versus Wade. And I, I don't want to be doing this, actually. I'd like to put myself out of a job by seeing the church get back into the business of, um, of um, responsibility and righteousness in the public square, to be a zealous and dogmatic for good ideas <laughs> and protecting the next generation, as the other side is for evil and bad ideas for the next generation. And so this project is to awaken the moral and spiritual intuitions of our ignorant brothers and sisters in the church. Uh, I'm not, it's not an attack, it's just most people don't know how we got here, um, so that they can get back into the business of building a culture of life, which means fighting against the culture of death. There hasn't been uh, a, a good film ever really made on Planned Parenthood and what I call the Sangerization of America. Moffat 21 is a great film. You should go watch it. It's about the history of black genocide, and it includes some history on Planned Parenthood. But we took a deeper dive to make sure that in this post Roe versus Wade moment, Jeff, the church and the broader culture um, can have some clarity about how we got here. And very briefly, the reason for that is important. The, in First Chronicles, it says that the sons of Issachar uh, were men who understood the times. And so it says they knew what Israel ought to do. But brother, that means if you don't understand the times, you won't know what the people of God ought to do. And so, yes, there are some bombshells in here that will rip your face off, and people will probably call me an Alex Jones, kooky, tin hat wearing conspiracy theorist, but I bring the receipts in both the film and the book uh, at this late hour of the culture of death so that we can awaken the greatest organism for change in human history, the blood-bought bride of Christ. I mean, Seth, Roe v. Wade fell. What does the church need to do now? Didn't we outlaw abortion with the fall of Roe v. Wade? I know. Isn't it sad, brother, how many, how many Christians and people who call themselves pro-life actually don't understand what happened when Roe v. Wade got overturned in Dobbs v. Jackson? It just went back to the states, um, which means now we have the opportunity to ban abortion at every state level, which means our rhino Republicans can no longer give us excuses why they can't ban abortion because, well, Roe versus Wade doesn't let me do that. No more excuses. But tragically, Jeff, it but means Seth, that the culture of death and the Democrats are working to codify abortion through point of birth. In they every are. State. And, and yep. pro-life Americans are losing. Every effort that has gone onto a ballot has gone the side of the radical abortionists in this country. And, and yep. it's heartbreaking, right? We got the right to change the law. And what we're seeing on the ground, even in some conservative states, is that people are choosing radical abortion bills, like in Colorado, totally unrestricted, up until the moment of birth. And now they want yep. public funding for it. So you're trying to, I love that line, Seth, build a culture of life. Talk to us more about that. Well, brother, uh, the pro-life movement used to be go, uh, used to go by another name, uh, Christendom, and Christianity was actually the name of the pro-life movement. Um, pro-life activism doesn't go back to 1973, brother. It goes back to the first century. Okay, it was Christians that were always saving <clears throat> infants abandoned to die, but also trying to ban the efforts to kill unborn babies uh, back thousands of years. This is actually a movement of Christianity. Now, I'll work with people who aren't Christians to save the unborn. Of course, let's save the babies, y'all. But this has always been a movement of Christians, and we need to get back to who we are, whose we are, and what our duty and calling is. And if we don't, we're going to continue seeing these stories of pro-life sidewalk counselors who just engaged in civil disobedience or a sit-in at an abortion center being thrown into federal prison by the Biden administration because those who murder the unborn cannot be trusted to govern the born. And those who murder the unborn will one day murder you too, the longer you tolerate the sacrament of Satan, church. And so you're going to learn some things in this documentary, like, I don't know, the founding board member of Planned Parenthood was the only American to have had a one-on-one -on -one meeting with Adolf Hitler and invited to the Third Reich in 1939 to meet with Robert Ley and Fritz Saukel and Heinrich Himmler and Adolf Hitler, whose book inspired the Nazi term Untermensch, meaning subhuman. So the Nazis got the term subhuman from the book of Planned Parenthood's first board member, uh, blessed and put on the board by Margaret Sanger. That's just one of the many things you're going to learn in the film and the book. And you can host a screening of this right now, Christian, at your church 
by going to the 1916project.com, the 1916project.com. This comes out later this year online for the world, Jeff. But because this is a ministry by and for the church, we're ha allowing churches, any church in the world, actually, we're getting requests from South America, Australia, and Ireland right now to host a screening at your church. And you can pre-order the book right now by going to the 1916project.com. You'll learn things that <laughs> that the church and even the pro-life movement has never taught you before. And if the, ch if the church wakes up, we can turn this entire American experiment around, Jeff, and finally tear down the high places of child sacrifice. Uh, speaking of church, the Southern Baptist Convention just last week voted uh, with regards to IVF and whether or not Christians should support it. This is kind of a new area in politics. What's your thoughts on IVF and how should Christians think about that, Seth Gruber? <laughs> Oh boy, you asked me that at the end of a short segment. Okay, so um, so as my friend Katie Faust says, a, a fellow warrior for life, um, uh, abortion and third-party reproductive technologies are two different sides of the same child commodifying coin. With abortion, we say because you're unwanted, baby, I can force you out of existence by violating your right to life. In third-party reproductive technologies, we say to the baby, because you're so wanted, I can force you into existence by denying you a right to your mother and father. Yes, some married couples, Jeff, use IVF because they can't have babies. But by and large, the increase in IVF and third-party reproductive technologies, Jeff, over the last couple of years have been a movement by the LGBTQ, LMNOP, IA, my name is Legion folks, who are not in a uh, reproductive, procreative relationship to get children for two daddies or two mommies. IVF is by and large today being used by people who are not a, a mom and dad so that they can get kids and violate the child's right to life and and oh, sorry right to their mother and father and by the way over 90% of babies created in labs in IVF are never born i don't know if you know that brother most christians don't know that over 90% of babies conceived in test tubes for the purposes of IVF will never be born. So IVF is not a child-friendly process, and you're creating multiple babies to increase the likelihood that one of them will implant. And I've lost donors who say, Seth, sh shut up. We should celebrate IVF because pro-lifers want more babies. Well, actually, not necessarily. We also believe a child has a right to their mother and father and a right to life. If you're sacrificing multiple babies who will who will be thawed out and die and never be born so you can get your one kid, that violates the child's right to life and their right to not be frozen. And call me crazy, Jeff, but I think human beings have a right to not be frozen. So the Southern Baptist Convention didn't go all the way in condemning IVF. They just said that a lot of its practices uh, are, are, to your point, rejecting the fact that there are lives created. So are you uh, advocating for a full blanket ban of IVF or just the kind of uh, practices like the Southern Baptist Convention pointed right. out that are not kid friendly? Right. Yeah, Jeff, we have or to completely friendly. ban IVF. And, and let me tell you very and very shortly why that is. There is no way that pro-life Christians are going to succeed in banning every form of IVF that gets kids to two daddies or two mommies or a single dad or a single mom. There's no way we're going to ban all forms of IVF that create multiple embryos at one time because you guys listening, you know how expensive IVF is. So in the vast majority of cases, even good Christian pro-lifers who think that IVF is okay, they start by creating one embryo at a time and then they realize how cost prohibitive it is. So they start creating multiple embryos, okay? So if we somehow banned even in the process of IVF, Jeff, as it pertains to creating multiple embryos, increasing the likelihood that many of them will never implant. And, and so maybe you get your one baby. And then somehow we maintain this one legal loophole, this one little foot in the door yeah. where the only ethical way to practice it, right, is, is, is one baby conceived at a time, one tried to be implanted at mom yeah. at a time for a married mother and father. We're not going to keep that exception. They're going to blow that door wide open. We need to ban the whole thing. Seth? Gruber, the CEO and founder of the White Rose Resistance. Thanks so much. Josh Hammer's up next. The Kansas City Attorney General is going after Pfizer. You're listening and watching The Jenna Ellis Tonight Show.
Well, friends, you might have heard that Mike Lindell and MyPillow no longer have the support of their box stores or shopping channels the way that they used to. They've been part of this cancel culture, so they want to pass along the savings directly to you by having a $25 extravaganza. I love that word, extravaganza. <laughs> when Mike started MyPillow, it was just a one product company. With the help of his dedicated employees, they now have hundreds of products, some you may not even know about. To get the word out, I want to invite my listeners to check out their $25 extravaganza. Two pack multi use My Pillows are just $25. My Pillow sandals, also awesome, only $25. Their six pack towel sets are $25. And brand new four pack dish towels, you guessed it, just $25. For the first time ever, the premium My Pillows with the all new Giza fabric, just $25. And orders over $75 will receive free shipping too. This amazing offer won't last long. Go to mypello.com, use the promo code Jenna, or call 800 564 8475 today. That's 800 564 8475, or go to mypello.com and use the promo code Jenna. Welcome to Jenna Ellis tonight. My name is Jeff Hunt. I'm filling in for my good friend, Jenna Ellis. I'm a radio host with the Salem Media Network in Denver, Colorado. Big headline, ground shaking. Could we finally be getting the truth with regards to the COVID vax? The attorney general of Kansas is suing Pfizer. Check out this headline. Kansas attorney general sues Pfizer over COVID vaccine. Kansas Attorney General Chris Kobach is suing the healthcare and pharmaceutical company Pfizer for alleged, quote, mishandled, misleading claims, unquote, the company made regarding the vaccine for COVID-19. Kobach's argument alleges Pfizer misled Kansans about the risks associated with vaccines, including to pregnant women and for myocarditis. The complaint also alleges Pfizer declined to participate in the federal government's vaccine development program known as Operation Warp Speed to avoid, yep, you guessed it, government oversight. Josh Hammer is the senior editor at large for Newsweek and host of The Josh Hammer Show. Welcome to Jenna Ellis tonight, Josh. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right, Josh, you're an attorney. I'm not. Is this a big deal? <laughs> What do you think of this lawsuit? Yeah, I do think that it's a pretty big deal. So, you know, first of all, Chris Kobach is an underappreciated hero of the conservative movement. I mean, a lot of people probably have never heard of who he is. You're missing out. Um, he has been the tip of the spear for a very long time now in defending America's sovereignty when it comes to fighting against illegal alien subversion of the electoral process, cleaning up voter rolls, trying to secure electoral integrity in, in our elections. He was really ahead of the curve a, a very long time before all the shenanigans that we saw in 2020. So I just want to say that I'm, I'm, a, I'm a longtime fan of Chris Kobach's, and, 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 it, and it pleases me that he is now leading this lawsuit against Pfizer. Now, when it gets to the actual lawsuit itself, Look, the the nature of lawsuits of this nature is that you have both sides that, especially the plaintiffs, obviously, by definition, are trying to kind of forum shop and try and a, a, a district judge, a federal judge who's going to be favorable to your claim. So, for example, I'm a barred attorney in Texas. Back when I was in Texas, it was very popular for the Texas Attorney's General Office to file suit in Wichita Falls specifically because that would be automatically assigned to a conservative-leaning federal district court judge named Reed O'Connor. Nowadays, they typically do it in Amarillo, Texas, because that's where Judge Matthew Kaczmarek is, another great conservative, great American. So a lot of this is going to depend where they where they actually filed this lawsuit. Eventually, it'll get up to the Tenth Circuit. That's the appellate court that Kansas is ultimately to. But I think I, I think to kind of get to the substance here, Jeff, I mean, like we should be hoping for accountability. We should be hoping for accountability because the Pfizer vaccine, frankly, all of the COVID vaccines, but the Pfizer vaccine was definitely a, a among the worst of them. Yeah, they definitely did not work as advertised. I mean, here in Florida, where I live now, we're still waiting to hear the results of this grant of this grand jury that our governor, Ron DeSantis, impaneled to try to kind of dig into COVID vaccine fraud, essentially that they were doing exactly what Chris Kobach alleges here, which is that they were misleading when it comes to the efficacy of their products. They said that they would be effective and it turns out they obviously were not there. So I, as someone who is himself very skeptical of the way that big pharma sold these drugs onto a very gullible and easily duped populace, I'm certainly hoping for a good result, but a lot of it's going to depend again on the judge, if this reaches a jury, the nature of the jury there and something like that. But 
we should all be happy at a bare minimum that lawsuits like this and this grand jury here in Florida, where we're still awaiting results, we should all be happy that these things are happening because we are still waiting, Jeff, for some semblance of accountability for the gigantic fraud that was perpetrated upon the American people during COVID-19. Well, Josh, one of the indicators that we're dealing with some revisionism taking place with regards to the COVID vaccines is how people are pointing out, well, there's always been side effects to these things. And I was like, and I was responding to the left going, yeah, but we didn't mandate these, these types of drugs to keep people's jobs like we did with COVID. I know every drug has side effects. COVID has side effects too. But with COVID, for instance, you got kicked out of the military if you didn't take the shot. You lost your job if you didn't get the shot. You couldn't go to some schools if you didn't get the shot. We forced this upon the American public up, up until essentially a mass mandate upon everybody, the amount of pressure that went upon people. And now they're kind of rolling back, go, well, yeah, we knew there were side effects, but uh, every drug has side effects. Give me a break. We all had to deal with this. And I don't think we had the truth. Yeah, you know, I, I mentioned how Chris Kobach is an underappreciated American hero. Another underappreciated American hero is the federal judge, Catherine Mizell, who is a district court judge here in Florida, young Trump nominee. She was the one who, in April of 2022, finally, finally, finally struck down the universal masking mandate when it comes to our airports, when it comes to our, our other common carriers, Amtrak, the railroads, all that stuff there. And, you know, essentially overnight, the masks, not just in America, but really around the world, because the Western world and Europe and everything, they really tend to follow America's lead on this stuff. After after Judge Mizell ruled that, it, it was within a week at the most, maybe even sooner than that, that the masks really start to fall away. So another underappreciated hero right there. Look, what happened during COVID-19 to the American people was unprecedented in American history. We have never, ever, ever, ever had an extended period in American history where we essentially shut down and locked down large swaths of society for effectively over a year, year, year and a half, two years, depending on exactly when you want to start the clock and finish the clock there. That's not the way that fighting pandemics has ever worked in American history. There are There's lots of precedent from colonial times of, of certain parts of cities tending to isolate and call for quarantines, trying to isolate the vulnerable, the elderly, people like that. But for the whole country, to shut down and then to do as you said and to mandate this this vaccine that they rushed through an operation war speed to mandate that we get it as a condition of employment as a condition to serve in the United States military for God's sake it's really evil actually a lot of what happened was profoundly evil and again we are still waiting for anything remotely resembling accountability and consequences we had this hearing with Anthony Fauci in Congress recently I I, I doubt anything is going to happen Anthony Fauci I certainly hope it does I hope that I'm wrong there but at a bare minimum Pfizer is a pretty good target and again I'm very happy happy that Attorney General Kobach is putting them in his crosshairs. Uh, Josh, we just got a few minutes left. It seems like a lot of this case comes down to the definition of safe and effective, that the FDA, that Pfizer were pushing out the COVID vax with the claim that it was safe and effective, meanwhile knowing they didn't have the research to be able to prove it. What say you? So if they look uh, again, you know, Kansas and whichever states join them, and I would hope that many Republican states will will join in on this lawsuit, they will have the opportunity to show that Pfizer might have been hiding the ball and was hiding information from the public and was misleading, as the as the complaint says, that they were selling their product in the way that was inconsistent with their internal labs, with their internal empirical data. If they can demonstrate that, then I frankly like their odds of prevailing here. Again, ultimately, this thing will get litigated. It's going to get appealed to the Tenth Circuit there. Maybe, maybe the Supreme Court will eventually have to weigh in here, but we haven't had a ton of these sprawling lawsuits. We have this now. We have this grand jury weighing its findings here in Florida, where I live. Hopefully other red states will, will continue to push against Pfizer, Moderna, and the rest of Big Pharma. Josh Hammer is the senior editor at large for Newsweek and host of The Josh Hammer Show. Thanks so much for being on Jenna Ellis tonight. Thank you so much. So when we come back, I'm going to talk to C.J. Pearson. He's a national chairman of the RNC Youth Advisory Council. Are young black Americans starting to leave the Democrat Party? Has Donald Trump achieved what Republicans have been trying to achieve for a long time and winning black voters over to the Republican cause? 
winning Hispanic voters over to the Republican cause. Shocking polls that have even put CNN in their place and left them speechless. You're not going to want to miss this conversation. CJ Pearson is up next on Jenna Ellis Tonight. Hi friends, Jenna Ellis, host of Jenna Ellis Tonight, and we are experiencing instability at every level. Our government lacks leadership and Bidenomics has been an utter disaster. The economy is in a fragile state. Inflation has been a constant issue. High interest rates have put significant pressure on the real estate market. There have been major bank failures and many analysts say a stock market correction is likely overdue. We have global conflicts in Europe and the Middle East and those have the potential to spread, but gold has soared to record highs even among the tensions. So there are so many reasons that Americans should consider wise investing and investments in gold and silver and legacy precious metals is the gold standard. I love Legacy Precious Metals because of their zero hassle education first approach. They can help you roll your traditional IRA into a gold IRA or ship metals directly to your house. Go to LegacyPMInvestments.com, download the free investor guide, and I have read it. There is so much valuable information there. Friends, now is the time to not roll the dice on your hard-earned money, find out about the growth potential that is in gold and that gold offers you. Contact Legacy Precious Metals and make sure to tell them that I sent you. Welcome to Jenna Ellis tonight. My name is Jeff Hunt. I'm filling in for my good friend, Jenna Ellis. I'm a radio host in Denver, Colorado on the Salem Media Network. You've got to watch CNN flip out about this poll. Cue the video. Biden and Trump among black voters compare where we were at this point in 2020 compare where we are now. You know, at this point, look at this. In 2020, Joe Biden was getting 86 percent of the African-American vote. Look at where it is now. It's 70 percent. That's a 16 point drop, John. And more than that, it's not just that Joe Biden is losing ground. It's that Donald Trump is gaining ground. You go from 7 percent single digits at this point in 2020 to now 21 percent. And again, John, I keep looking for signs that this is going to go back to normal. And I don't see it yet in the polling If anything. Right now, we're careening towards a historic performance for Republican presidential candidate, the likes of which we have not seen in six decades. That is an absolute freak out by the leftist media establishment. I have never seen anything like that before. Joining us to provide commentary is CJ Pearson. He's a national chairman of the RNC Youth Advisory Council. Thanks for joining Jenna Ellis tonight, CJ. Thank you so much, Jeff. Now, you don't look too much like Jenna, but uh, always good to be with you and see you. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, what they get to is that essentially the black community has had enough with the Democratic Party. You broke with Democrats a long time ago. Why is the black community waking up and joining Republicans now? Yeah, I think it's as simple as people in the black community are starting to realize that woke and broke don't just rhyme, but they're synonymous with one another. And black Americans are tired of being woke and broke in Joe Biden's America. You're looking at inflation, which is disproportionately hurting the black and brown communities. You're looking at their efforts to defund the police, which disproportionately harms black and brown communities. Every single progressive policy that the Democrats have been running on for the past several years have disproportionately harmed the black community. And now more than ever, I think they're starting to read the writing on the wall and say that enough is enough. CJ, one of the big differences in that poll is the difference between older black Americans and younger black Americans. Younger black Americans are willing to break with the Democrat Party. You're a young black American. Why is that? Well, you know, I think it just goes back to the old truth, right? That old habits die hard. I think there are a lot of older people who have probably voted Democrat all their life just out of habit more than anything. Uh, but I think young black Americans are starting to really ask themselves the question, what has Joe Biden ever done for me? What have the Democrats ever done for me? And when they ask that question, they come up short every single time. It's exactly why I'm not surprised to see that so many of them are breaking away from the Democrat plantation.
Uh, C.J. Pearson, I want to ask you about how Donald Trump achieved this. Look, Mitt Romney wanted to appeal to black Americans. So did John McCain. So did George W. Bush. But Donald Trump did it. We just got a few minutes. How did Donald Trump appeal differently than other Republicans? You know, by being himself and not trying to pander to anyone, but also helping America win. Because at the end of the day, when America wins, we all win. It doesn't matter if you're black, brown, yellow, or orange. When you are implementing good policy that is putting America first, uh, you know, a rising tide lifts everyone up. And that's exactly what the Trump administration was able to achieve during his first four years and will achieve once again when he's reelected in November. C.J. Pearson is a national chairman of the RNC Youth Advisory Council. How can young people be involved in this upcoming campaign? You know, volunteer, make phone calls, go door knocking your local community. Guys, every single thing that you think, you know, is on the line in this election is indeed on the line. Our future as a nation, we deserve to have the opportunity to have our children grow up in a country just as great as the one that our grandparents did. And that starts with us. So guys, tweet, door knock, do all that you can and bring a car full of people to the polls in November. CJ Pearson, thanks so much for joining the Jenna Ellis show. I got to tell you, I have never seen a freak out like I saw CNN right there. Coming up next, we're going to talk about this effort from 23 Republican attorney generals to defend the free speech rights of Donald Trump. You're not going to want to miss it. You're watching The Jenna Ellis Tonight Show. Welcome to Jenna Ellis tonight. My name is Jeff Hunt. I'm filling in for my good friend, Jenna Ellis. I'm a radio host on the Salem Media Network in Denver, Colorado. All right, 24 attorney generals representing red states are coming to the defense of Donald Trump against Jack Smith, trying to protect his free speech rights. Check out this headline. Red states ask court to stop Jack Smith's gag order against Trump in Florida documents case, a group of 24 Republican state attorneys generals have filed an amicus brief in former President Trump's classified documents case asking a Florida court not to grant special counsel Jack Smith's gag order request, calling it, quote, presumptively unconstitutional, unquote, free and fair elections in the United States depend on candidates' ability to speak about important issues of the day. Attempts to stop a candidate from speaking out harm more than just the candidate. They also hurt the voters who are denied access to crucial, crucial information and the states which are responsible for managing elections, said the Southern District of Florida. And when agents of one candidate seek a court order to muzzle discussion on matters relating to important electoral issues, the restraint raises even more fundamental First Amendment concerns, the brief said. Well, joining us is Chris Murray. He's deputy general counsel for Romney Ryan in 2012. Welcome to Jenna Ellis tonight. Hey, uh, hi there, Jeff. Nice to be with you. So let's talk about this amicus brief that was submitted. Republicans coming to the, de the defense of Donald Trump trying to protect his free speech rights. This is all about Jack Smith and the documents case. Why do they want to try to restrict Donald Trump in the first place? Well, I mean, if you'll remember, this is the uh, this is the motion that was filed by Jack Smith at the 11th hour right before Memorial Day weekend. And actually, the first version of this motion uh, was actually struck by the court because uh, Jack Smith's attorneys uh, didn't actually even talk with Donald Trump's attorneys before they filed the first motion. Um, so this motion that we're dealing with is the second version. But why do they want to muzzle President Trump? Well, they want to muzzle President Trump because he put out some tweets um, that talked about the use of force policy uh, that the FBI had in place for the raid at Mar-a-Lago. And part of that use of force policy says, of course, if somebody uh, is presenting a threat uh, to those folks who are uh, uh, engaged in the search warrant there, that uh, an FBI agent can use deadly force. Um, that's not surprising, but President Trump has made political hay out of that, and Jack Smith doesn't like it. 
And was Donald Trump lying when he put out those tweets or just kind of exaggerating or what? What was your take on that? I mean, so look, like the DOJ's use of force policy isn't a surprise to anybody, right? Of course, an FBI agent who's executing a search warrant is going to have the right to use deadly force. I think, to be honest, President Trump stretched the truth some uh, when he said that these agents want to, you know, they were what uh, itching to do the unthinkable and to do harm to him or his family. I mean, they weren't. They, they raided Mar-a-Lago uh, when President Trump wasn't there in order, I think, to avoid a confrontation with President Trump. But when President Trump said what the use of force policy said, he wasn't lying about that. Yeah, I know. It raised a lot of eyebrows about this. So uh, in your sense, do you think Jack Smith is engaging in this type of lawfare? Is this an effort to try to stop the Republican nominee from being able to freely speak about this case? Because, look, these cases matter just as much in the court of public opinion as they do in the actual court court. Um, so do you think this is an effort to engage in lawfare or is this an the FBI yeah. agents and everyone involved in the case. Yeah, I mean, look, Jeff, I, I think that this is Jack Smith, right, is the pot calling Trump the kettle black, right? To the extent that Donald Trump uh, stretched the truth or exaggerated when he talked about, oh boy, there's this use of force policy and the agents were just hoping to do something bad to Trump at Mar-a-Lago. Okay, the president stretched the truth there. Jack Smith is stretching the truth when he says that somehow Donald Trump's tweets about this are endangering those FBI agents or endangering the prosecution's team. That's the whole basis for Jack Smith's motion, is that somehow the law enforcement agents involved in Jack Smith's team are going to be themselves subject to threats, harassment, um, to violence from Trump supporters. Of course, that's not true. And of course, I think that these Republican attorneys general are right to point that out in their amicus brief supporting the president. So let's talk about the different judges in these two cases. Conservatives saying that the judge up in Manhattan was compromised. He was an, a, a Democrat. He had, uh, donated to Joe Biden and even an organization titled Stop Republicans. And so Donald Trump did not get a free and fair trial up in Manhattan. Now I feel like I'm hearing from liberals that the judge down in Florida was an appointee from Donald Trump and that she's sabotaging the case and that the, the, the government's not going to get a free and fair trial down in Florida. What's your take on this judge down in Florida with regards to the documents case that Donald Trump's facing? I think Judge Eileen Cannon down in Florida um, so far, uh, you know, by everything I can see, uh, I think that she's trying to run this case right down the middle. Okay. Um, I think that she is probably a little bit skeptical um, of some of the prosecution's theories. Um, I think that she was clearly unhappy that the prosecution filed for this gag order right before Memorial Day weekend without talking to the president's lawyers. But any judge would be angry about that in any case. I mean, I'm, I'm a lawyer. I practice in court all the time. You can see from the mess behind me, right? Um, I... I you don't file a motion for extraordinary relief without talking to the other side. Why? Because sometimes you're able to work it out and it saves the court time and effort. So I don't think Judge Cannon has done anything that is uh, strange or that looks like it's not giving the government a fair shot in this case. Um, I think she's being very careful because she knows the eyes of the country are on her. I think that's smart. Now, why would 24 attorney generals representing all these different states, I mean, that's almost half the country, right? Why would they send in an amicus brief about this case? What does this have to do with their states? Well, so, so I mean, I, I think it's, what it has to do with their states is their states get to run the presidential election, right? Um, and their citizens have a right to hear from all the candidates for president, including President Trump. And if there's a gag order keeping President Trump from speaking about this litigation, which is now a campaign issue, Joe Biden is making these cases a campaign issue, right? Um, if there's a gag order that keeps the president from speaking about this, they're saying, hey, it could influence the elections in their state. I think the strongest or the most important part of their brief is toward uh, the bottom of page 17, early page 18. They say that if a prior restraint, that's a gag order, 
against President Trump is issued in the middle of a presidential election, that it would set an unsettling precedent for future political candidates and that opportunistic prosecutors or lawyers, some maybe even lawyers for presidential candidates, would look to that order to try to find a way to influence other future elections. Now, of course, but, uh, that's didn't, didn't Alvin Bragg do this? Chris, didn't Alvin Bragg do this? What's what's different between Jack? What's the difference between Jack Smith doing this? Well, so I, I think the answer is is that there's not much different with it. Um, this has become the playbook for prosecutors who are going after President Trump is to try and get a gag order, right? Because then it forces the judge, right, to go head to head with President Trump. Because we all know. President Trump, you put a gag order on him, he's going to test it, right? I mean, if he's going to, uh, he's not going to get off of Twitter or Truth Social, right? He's going to say what he wants to say. And the prosecutors are trying to force the judge into a position of confrontation with President Trump. Unbelievable. Chris Murray, former deputy general counsel for Romney Ryan in 2012. Thanks so much for helping us break down this case. Hey, it's my pleasure, Jeff. Have a great day. So when we come back, if you are going to advise Donald Trump or Joe Biden going into the upcoming debate, what would you tell them? I'd probably advise Donald Trump, put on an orange jumpsuit and be licking an ice cream cone when you walk up there. Let's troll Joe Biden a little bit. Big debate coming up soon. You're not going to want to miss this discussion. Tho Bishop from the Mises Institute joins us next on Jenna Ellis Tonight. Welcome to Jenna Ellis tonight. My name is Jeff Hunt. I'm filling in for my good friend, Jenna Ellis. I'm a radio host with the Salem Media Network in Denver, Colorado. All right, June 27th. That's the night we've all been waiting for. Joe Biden, Donald Trump in a debate. Oh my goodness, what's gonna happen? Check out these headlines. CNN finalizes the, ru the rules for the first Biden versus Trump debate and RFK Jr could still qualify. The network noted that candidates' podiums and positions will be determined by a coin flip. Their mics will be muted. I, I wish they didn't have. I would like to see an unmuted mic outside of speaking time. I'd like to see Trump comment on Biden's comments. And they will only pro be provided with a pen and notepad and a bottle of water. Candidates will not be allowed to bring props or prepared notes. For the first time in recent history, the debate between presidential contenders won't have a studio audience. The network said debate monitor moderators will use all tools at their disposal to enforce timing and ensure a civilized discussion. To qualify for the CNN showdown, a candidate must have received 15% support in four separate national polls and be on the ballot in enough states to reach 270 electoral college votes. Currently, Kennedy is on the ballot in six states, totaling 89 potential electoral college votes. Tho Bishop, editorial and content manager for the Mises Institute, joins us. Welcome to the Jenna Ellis Tonight Show. Thank you for having me. Glad to be here. All right, so you got to advise Donald Trump going into this debate. What do you tell him? Well, to me, modern debates are more about vibe and substance. I wish that wasn't the case. I think for Trump, first and foremost, is you know what he has benefited from in the past. He's he's a great uh, contraster. Like that's why he really set himself apart in the uh, Republican debates in 2016. He needs to be entertaining Trump. Uh, yeah, I think of the 2020 debates. You know, he talked over Biden a lot. Um, I think that rubbed certain voters the wrong way. His polling kind of declined after that. But he needs to kind of be the happy warrior uh, and not give into I think the temptations to be. Uh, focusing too much on the woe is me grievance side of stuff, though you know there's plenty of there to work for. But he needs to be the happy warrior, the entertainer in chief from a, a visual side. And then when it gets to substance, being able to tie in, obviously one of the biggest drivers in this election right now is the poor state of the economy, something that's affecting every working class voter. Being able to not only contrast his message and uh, you know his record 
um, you know, with with what people remember, right? There's a nostalgia aspect that is going to benefit him um, going into this election. But tying that into broader conversations about the immigration in particular, um, I think that's going to be ground that he's going to want to hit on first and foremost. I agree entirely with you. I was a little disappointed to see that he couldn't bring props because I would have liked him to dress in an orange jumpsuit and walk up licking an ice cream cone just to <laughs> troll the entire stage at that point. All right. So you're you're advising Joe Biden now. What do you tell the Biden campaign to do? Well, first and foremost, I think everyone's going to be holding their breath in the Biden camp until the cameras are off. Um, you know, the uh, State of the Union address, right, is kind of held as a moment where Biden was able to keep everything together. But obviously, he's reading from a teleprompter. Um, you know, how aggressive is Trump going to be with the rules of the debate to try to throw him off his course? You know, I don't know what sort of drugs he's going to be on, maybe you know, tapping into to Hunter's stash for that one. But, you know, the biggest thing is going to be trying to uh, prevent any further fueling of all the obvious issues with his age and his command of the issues. Now, when it gets to substance there as well, you know, we've seen him pivot away from a conversation about how great the economy is going, trying to lean into kind of DC talking points about, you know, don't believe your lying eyes. You know, look at this uh, chart of GDP. It's doing great. Um, he spun that off in the last few months on trying to go after corporations. I expect that to be kind of lining up on that, that corporate greed, um, almost kind of a Bernie-esque populist side. I think that is going to be the economic message that he's going to try to, to lean into, trying to create a scapegoat away from his own policies to, again, address that number one issue in this election right now, which is the state of the economy. So do you think Republicans have set expectations too low for Joe Biden? Like we, if the guy just shows up and makes it through without you know falling over, is he going to win the debate? I think that is a problem. I think it was also a problem in 2020. You know, we had a very similar dynamic there. I mean, I, I think you know visually, you know, we get a lot more reminders of the mental state of Joe Biden now that he is in office and not in his basement. But I do think that is a valid concern. I mean, again, that's why the you know it, it, this is, debate is a win if there's not a viral moment of Biden spacing out during this. Um, <laughs> and so I and that's that's going to be again that that is the question going into this thing. So last question, we've only got a few seconds. Do you think RFK Jr. should be on the debate stage? I do. I'd like to see the contrast of ideas. He should be. But unfortunately, in the, the system we have right now, it is built not to allow for, for candidates like him to go on the stage. But I think particularly when it comes to COVID and medical freedom issues, I mean, there's definitely a platform there. Um, so if he's on this one, maybe he'll get the next one. But I'm, I'm expecting that there's going to be no big appetite for allowing that outside voice on these debate stages. I'd like to hear from him, too. So, Bishop, editorial and content manager for the Mises Institute, thanks so much for being on the Jenna Ellis Tonight Show. Thank you for having me. That's all we have for tonight. Thank you all for tuning in to Jenna Ellis. My name's Jeff Hunt. Till next time.